the circle crusher, someone who causes fallout in male social groups and is usually a girl harboring malicious intent. After being murdered in an accident caused by one of these circle crushers, Toma, the story's protagonist, has been transported to another world. In this fantasy land, inside the holy empire Kirabaha, Toma <laughs> is now the leader of White Oath, a three-man adventuring team. The party is celebrating their safe return from today's mission and gets to boozing. There, Toma remarks at how they have scored a heavy bag today and asks his team members, Clay the Mage and Gornoff the Tanker, how they will spend it. As a result, Clay explains that he will buy more spell books while Gornoff wants to buy tickets to his favorite dancer's show. Apparently, it has been two years since the three of them formed a party. Although they were all vastly different personality-wise, they got along quite well. All of a sudden, Gornoff begins talking about the A-class party in the neighboring town and how their team collapsed. Hearing this, Tama is left taken aback. As far as he heard, that team had very good chemistry between them. However, their collapse was brought about by the white mage who joined their party recently. Soon after her joining, the party disbanded. Hearing this, Tama feels a sudden chill, explaining that his collapse detector skill, the one given to him by the goddess, just got an alert. Nevertheless, Clay proclaims that there is no way that any sort of danger would appear inside the tavern, suggesting that maybe his skill range is just too wide. With this, they go back to the A-class team, where Clay and Gornoff both agree that being in a male-only party is the best. In addition, with the chemistry they have, they will never collapse under any kind of danger. Consequently, they begin planning their next adventure, and Toma suggests they head into the West Side Forest, where a cave is hiding a dungeon inside it. All of a sudden, a big booba girl comes stumbling into the tavern. She introduces herself as Maria, a white mage, and claims she wants to join their party. Seeing this beauty, both Gornoff and Clay immediately retract their way of thinking, excited by the arrival of this girl. Obviously, Tama points out their hypocrisy. However, the two of them don't really care and immediately begin catering to Maria. Nonetheless, being the responsible leader, Toma inquires as to why she wants to join their party. As such, Maria, with a saddened expression, explains that she was actually kicked out of her previous party. After they all got trapped by a monster in the dungeon, she was abandoned. Not only that, solo adventuring is extremely challenging, and that is when she heard about the reputation of White Oath. Hearing this sob story, Clay and Gornoff feel sad for her and tell her to join them instead, and Maria pounces on the opportunity to do so. But despite everyone's eagerness, Toma is still not convinced, and so, to make up his mind, Maria uses her huge knockers and tries to change Toma's mind. However, all of a sudden, the collapse detector skill once again goes off. Anyway, he decides to let Maria join for a trial week so they can see if she is a good fit for them, ordering Clay and Gornoff to teach her the ropes. Consequently, they both surround Maria and begin talking to her. All the while, Maria makes a malicious expression, remarking at how gullible these idiots are. The very next day, the team meets up to head out on their journey. However, Tama is enraged after seeing his teammates are half naked. Apparently, Maria's equipment was very bad, and to celebrate her joining, they decide to buy her a new staff. However, they didn't have enough money to do so, and as a result, they simply sold their armor to get more funds. Of course, Tama calls them both idiots, but they explain that even if they get injured, they have Maria, who can heal them both. Hearing this explanation, Tama reluctantly agrees, and they decide to begin their journey. On the other hand, Maria knows this is a suicidal act, and, in her mind, tells Tama to act as the leader and stop them from going out in such a state. Even though her new staff is very good, she can't be bothered to deal with these two shirtless dumbasses. Hence, she vows to quickly defeat White Oath's leader and crush this party. Meanwhile, Toma's collapse detector skill acts up again. This time, he realizes this alert is coming from Maria, but he fails to understand how a healer could pose them any threat. As such, after praying that something unfortunate doesn't happen to them, the team finally makes their way to the dungeon and begins killing monsters. There, the threat of collapse is still present, and Toma feels his skill constantly alerting him. Eventually, they kill off the monsters and begin harvesting the magic stones. 
While Maria picks them up, she leaves herself exposed, causing Clay and Gornoff to keep glancing at her. In the meantime, Tama is seen worried over this, claiming they both are too excited. Nevertheless, Maria finishes the collection, and Toma wants to keep them safe with him. Consequently, Maria heads over to him, and using this chance, she accidentally stumbles on top of Toma, pressing all her assets firmly onto him. This once again sends his collapse detector skill to send an intense alert. However, this is just too strange. There isn't even a monster in sight, but from this, Toma remembers something. He has been a part of a similar situation when, in his real world, a girl did the same thing to Toma, trying to make him fall for her. But this time, things are different. He already has this strange eye and now realizes that the Larisart were warning him about Mariah, even though he is perplexed at the fact that there is even a fake version of the Circle Crusher, he immediately distances himself from Mariah, claiming that these girls are the worst enemy for male-only parties. Seeing <gasps> them jump away, Maria is left stumped at how her attack had no effect, wondering if Tama is actually a virgin. However, after seeing the look in his eye, she too understands that he has figured out her true identity. However, the serious atmosphere is broken apart when Clay and Gornoff come over to them, asking if they are all right. Consequently, Maria, reverting back to her usual airheaded demeanor, announces that she simply tripped. In her mind, her victory is already assured. She thinks that no matter what, the other two have already fallen head over heels for her and now won't listen to anything Toma has to say. To her, guys are just beasts who think with their lower heads. And so her pressure increases and the chill Toma feels gets more intense. In the face of such a threat, he has to use all his might to withstand her attacks, but this is no time for him to cower. His failure would mean the collapse of his beloved party and he will not allow that. With this, Toma suggests they celebrate the completion of their mission and Maria agrees, leading to them all drinking away at the tavern. And only moments later, both Gornoff and Clay pass out drunk, leaving Maria and Toma the only ones conscious. This leaves Toma very dubious as he wonders why his comrades have already been knocked out despite the fact they just started drinking. This makes Maria his only target at the moment, but nonetheless, he is not an easy opponent. He has experience with these sorts of situations from back on Earth, and he kicks his plan into motion. Not long after, Maria also realizes what Tama is up Apparently, he has been drinking equal parts water and wine, along with eating things filled with taurin and mucilage to help him stay awake and fight off against Maria's advances. Seeing this, even Maria is left stumped, commenting on how he has tricks up his sleeve. Nevertheless, she too has more strategy to make him fall for her, and all of a sudden she comes closer to him. Placing her hand on his leg, she presses her mommy milkers onto him, proclaiming that he is already drunk. Obviously, this advance is too exciting for a healthy young boy, but she doesn't stop there. Maria then begins talking about how Toma was wielding his sword very proficiently. All of this in combination makes Toma unable to hold off his desires, and he begins to stare at her chest. And this is when she takes the final step. Caressing his leg with her own, she asks if Toma can also teach her all kinds of things next time when it's only the two of them. Hearing these steamy words whispered into his ears, Toma is left defenseless. He becomes disillusioned, even though he knows she is merely pretending. On the other hand, Maria thinks this battle has ended in her victory, but that doesn't seem to be the case. As soon as his glass empties, Maria fills it back up, and he begins drinking away, wondering how he will wake up the rest of his team. But it looks like he should firstly fear for his own well-being. All of a sudden, his body becomes heavy, and his head begins to black out. This makes him think if there was maybe a sleeping potion in the wine, and this is revealed to be the case. Maria has finally brought Tama to the ground, though he was admittedly her toughest opponent by far, and the next thing he knows, Toma opens his eyes to find himself in an unfamiliar location. His mind is still fuzzy, and his collapse detector skill is still going off. As such, to learn where he is, Toma looks around, finding Maria sitting right beside him. In addition, he realizes they are inside of a love hotel. But even though he realizes this, his body is still too heavy. This must be the effects of the sleeping potion, he thinks, but what can he do now? 
he has been drugged and was dragged into a love hotel. Clay and Gornoff, who have already fallen for Maria, will definitely question why the two of them were in a love hotel. Moreover, if someone spots them both leaving the hotel together, rumors will spread like wildfire. However, there is still time. Seeing as it is night, if he runs out right now, no one will be able to see his face. If he is unable to run away by sunrise, it's his loss, he realizes. <gasps> Consequently, despite his current state, Toma haphazardly gets back on his feet. Seeing this, Maria is left taken aback. She questions how on earth he was able to wake up already since the effects of the potion should still be in effect. But after seeing how much Tama is sweating, she understands that the effect must still be heavy. Nonetheless, Tama withstanding this special potion, using only his willpower, is an impressive feat. Maria even went as far as to use her special potion, which is supposed to last six hours and make the victim drowsy as time goes by. Therefore, if she can only stall for time, the effect will once again overwhelm Tama and he will collapse. On the other hand, Toma also realizes this and wants to get out as quickly as possible. He thanks Maria for taking care of him after he passed out drunk, but now he is sober enough to leave. But Maria intervenes, stating that it was Toma who brought her here to have some fun in their alone time. Of course, this is a lie, but Toma just proclaims that he will have to pass for today. However, Maria keeps insisting that they do it since she is in the mood. Ultimately, Maria's plan to stall for time works, and Toma, having reached his limits, falls face first on the bed. Seeing this, Maria comments on how tough Toma really is, but now, the fact that they share the bed will be solidified. This marks her as the victor of their battle. Now, she will simply make up a story about how Toma assaulted her while putting up a tearful act, creating great cracks in the White Oath's brotherhood. All the while, Toma is slowly losing consciousness. Despite having experience from Earth, he was still defeated, but there is a limit to how much one can endure. And the only way he was able to make it this far was because of his comrades. But remembering them, he once again reaffirms his goal to not let this party collapse. Using his skill points, he unleashes the full status recovery skill, and this makes him able to get back up on his own feet. That too, with all his stats recovered. Seeing this, Maria is left speechless. Tama has far exceeded her expectations repeatedly, and now her only option is to inject some poison directly into Toma's body. But the problem for her is that Toma is a combat type. Being a healer, she has no chance of getting close to him, and as such, she will have to use weakened and find a chance to inject her poison. And there is only one way she will be able to do so, an expose. Consequently, she begins stripping her clothes looking to create some distractions, and this is highly effective. Seeing her bare skin, even Toma is unable to go into the Zen state. But despite this, he vows to hold on for dear life. But all of a sudden, Maria stops moving. Noticing this, Toma realizes something, asking if Maria has never let a man see her naked body before, and her reaction gives it all away. As she turns red as a beet, Toma pokes further, asking if this means she has also never done it with anyone. Furious and embarrassed, Maria lashes out, confirming this to be the truth. To this, Toma then asks why she is resorting to such a thing now if this is the case. He remarks that her skills as a white mage are remarkable, so much so that she can make a living without lying to men. But she is not willing to answer. Instead, Maria announces that she will return Clay and Gornoff's money and leave the town tomorrow. But that is not enough for Tama. He exclaims that he has once already been involved with a girl like Maria in the past. And to him, it didn't look like Maria was lying when she said it is difficult to adventure solo. However, Maria claims that it doesn't matter. Surely, Tama will not keep a liar in his party revealing she is also the one who brought Collapse to the A-Class team in the neighboring town. But Toma then exclaims that he already thought of Maria as his comrade. This <gasps> takes her by surprise, and she ultimately backs off, announcing that she has lost interest and tells Toma to wear some clothes and get out. In response, he questions if Maria will come to the dungeon exploration tomorrow. However, before she can answer, she accidentally stumbles on top of Toma this time not on accident. In addition to this, her bra, which was holding back her gigantic milkers, also pops open, and she falls breast first into Toma, 
sending him flying out the window. Regardless, this marks Toma's victory since he was able to escape successfully. Later on, Maria writes a letter to someone. In a castle on top of a mountain, a crow is seen delivering a letter to a bathing woman. Seeing the crow, the woman opens up the letter, learning that the ultimate attack she taught Maria has failed. Not only that, the letter mentions that it was as if the guy already expected this tactic. This makes the woman think if maybe the guy was from Earth and upon reading the name of the victim, she remarks at how it seems that Toma has also been brought into this world. The next morning, Toma heads to the meetup spot. On the way, he reveals that Kirabahua is said to be the place where heroes are summoned by the goddess. In addition, the heroes should have fought the demon king by now. However, that is not his role in this world. At least, that is what he thinks. Nevertheless, he has somehow stumbled into a foe even scarier than the demon king, aka Maria. All of a sudden, the foe in question sneaks up behind him in a nonchalant manner. This frightens Toma, and he takes a step back, immediately baffled at the fact Maria came here today. But she claims there is no way she would just walk away after what happened last night. However, the mention of yesterday is enough to make them both flustered and Maria, in order to hide her embarrassment, proclaims that the reason for her return is to take revenge on Toma for what transpired. This threat triggers Toma's collapse detector skill, whereas Mariah continues, stating that she is not the same person she was in the past. Although wary, Toma also doesn't step down, asking if she plans on still continuing after revealing her true colors. But to her, this tactic also has its own perks. In the first place, Tama already knew her intentions but still almost fell into her advances. Obviously, Tama tries to deny this, but Maria knows he's lying. With this, she plops her knockers in front of his face, making him remember just how truly impressive her firepower is. On the other hand, Maria reveals that she has a new weapon she can utilize. Apparently, she got a necklace from that person, which is actually a magic tool to catch lies. Moreover, the results of this can only be shown to the user Maria, in this case. And so she once again begins making her advance, this time with certainty that Toma is falling for her traps. Meanwhile, Toma, despite being weak to this thought's attacks, is still adamant on facing this circle crusher head-on and announces that they will settle things with a duel. Anyways, they head to the Adventure Guild to meet up with the rest of the team, only to see Callie and Gornoff in the most ridiculous outfits. Seeing this, Tama inquires what is up with their getup, and they just claim they are following the trends. Both of them compliment each other's fashion, and Maria thinks that maybe these two idiots are just trying to put on a show for her. However, the necklace remains silent, implying that they both really think they look cool, and believe me, they do not. Regardless, <sighs> Tama claims that they have to head out and accept a commission today, and hence, they head to the Yuza Plains dungeon. There, he remarks at how refreshing it is to be in the outdoors for a change. What's more, it looks like Maria has kept her word and returned the staff money to Clay and Gornoff, though they seem to be not very happy about it. However, Maria, using her feminine charms, tells them that although she can heal them both, she doesn't want to see any of them hurt. Her powerful attack overwhelms the simpletons, but Toma remains unaffected, and this is enough for her. In her mind, she has already captivated the other two, and only Toma is left remaining. As a result, she deploys another of her techniques. <gasps> Using the gusty wind, she accidentally reveals her panties and acts timidly. Of course, the three dudes are always waiting for such a moment and ingrain the sight in their minds. However, after seeing Maria's shy act, they deny seeing anything, though her necklace tells her they did. Just like she predicted, these guys are just too easy to read. So much so that Maria is starting to get bored. All of a sudden, Thomas' skill once again gets triggered. He feels an intense chill from behind at Maria and warns her that a horde of skeletons has emerged behind her, telling her to run away. But Maria is left paralyzed with fear, unable to move. Apparently, she has no tricks that can do anything against undead-type mobs. Just as her life begins to flash before her eyes, out of nowhere, Gornoff arrives in the nick of time, protects her, and in the blink of an eye, Clay launches his lightning magic and eradicates the horde. With this, Tama then comforts the distressed Maria and tells her everything is all right now. 
Consequently, the team gets into formation and begins fighting off the remaining undead and eventually, they are able to make it out of that situation in one piece. After achieving victory, they all light a fire and have a meal. There, Maria comments on how, even though they seem like idiotic perverts, they really are sometimes else. Suddenly, Tama comes up to her, asking if he can sit beside her. There, he first compliments his team at how reliable they are and then compliments Maria, calling her an excellent member of the party. And although she wants this to be a lie, Maria's necklace gives no reaction, revealing that this is what Tama really means. Obviously, after she tried to deceive him, she is taken aback by just how good of a guy Tama really is, and this marks Tama's victory for today. The fact is, Maria must trust White Oath a little more now, but she denies this, though her necklace announces that she is lying. Hearing the necklace's reaction, she gets embarrassed, calling this item a piece of junk. Later that night, Maria asks Toma if he can tell her where to find a good church. Apparently, she is a bit worried that she could have been cursed, and hence she wants to visit one just in case. Hearing this, Toma falls into thought and soon tells her that there is a place he always visits for prayer. What's more, that place also happens to be the home of an amazing nun, amazing in more than one way. As a result, the next morning, Toma brings Maria to the church he always visits. On the way, Maria seems to be extremely distressed, clinging onto Toma's arm and pressing her mommy milkers onto him. Seeing this, Toma comments on how, even though she looks like a normal girl, scared of the undead, she is actually an A-class circle crusher. Not only that, since he was carelessly tricked by her once, he is curious as to why she became a circle crusher in the first place. However, knowing her deep-rooted hatred for men, it doesn't seem likely that she will tell him about her past so easily. Anyway, they both eventually reach the church and walk in after Toma warns her not to do anything weird inside. There, they are greeted by this amazingly big nun who is ecstatic to see Toma arrive. This nun is introduced as Sophia, who is delighted to see Toma's face twice in one week. Toma reveals he is here because of his friend, which just so happens to be a girl. Seeing Maria by his side, a rather passive-aggressive tone is already set into motion. Sophia seems to be already skeptical of Maria, but they both exchange pleasantries regardless. Suddenly, Maria remarks at how they both seem to be pretty close, and Toma explains that Sophia took care of him in the past. Apparently, this was the first church Tama went to after being sent to this world by the culprit of his transmutation, the goddess Urania, also known as the goddess of love and worship. Moreover, Sophia was the one who taught him everything about the goddess. Hearing these compliments, Sophia is delighted, claiming that she was merely performing her duties as a devout believer. Eventually, they get onto the topic at hand, and Toma tells Sophia the reason for their visit. He claims that Maria is worried she might have been cursed, and hearing this, Sophia gets closer and grabs her face. After a moment of silence, she announces that she cannot sense any traces of a curse inside Maria, making her feel extremely relieved. However, Sophia reveals that, in case she is still worried, the church has a special purification service available at any time, and Maria decides to partake. Consequently, she heads over to a couple of priests who begin the purification ritual. In the meanwhile, Sophia uses this time alone with Toma to inquire about Maria. Apparently, she thought Toma had banned girls from his team and from Maria's arrival. She has become a bit worried. She asks if he is dating Maria. What's more, it seems as if Maria is eavesdropping on their conversation and begins paying close attention. However, he immediately and adamantly refuses, making Mariah furious that he didn't even blush at this statement. But Sophia is still concerned. She claims that even if that is the case, Toma too is a man, and it must be a big distraction that a pretty lady like Maria is around with them while exploring. But Toma reveals that it is rather handy to have a white mage in the group, though she is trying to collapse their team. Hearing this, Sophia is relieved and apologizes for her impolite questions, but he tells her to pay it no mind. All of a sudden, Sophia proclaims that she has something she needs to discuss with Toma. She wants to harvest his spores. Obviously, her weird wording makes Toma turn red as a beet, but Sophia explains that she wants to harvest a specific type of mushroom, which only grows in dungeons, but this could be a risky mission with all the monsters roaming around. 
Hearing this, Sophia suggests that he too join in on the adventure, boasting her magical prowess. But Toma doesn't really feel like putting her in danger and tries to shoot her down. However, Sophia begins feeling disheartened at the fact that even though Mariah is fine, she is not. Seeing this, Tama tries to cheer her up and ultimately agrees to let her join. With this, she asks what mushrooms they are after, and he claims that the mushroom she is looking for is known as the Agric Shroom. This brings us to the Ruins Dungeon where the entire White Oath, along with Sophia, is seen battling a horde of monsters. There Maria taunts Toma at how the entry conditions for females in this party are very loose. As they fight the mob, Gornoff and Clay both remark at how beautiful Sophia is and how they would visit the church every week to see if they had a beauty like her waiting for them. Not only that, her presence is enough to take the attention off of Maria, making her angry that all her progress is slowly being undone. Suddenly, Maria asks what Sophia is actually capable of. In her mind, priests specialize in purification magic, but that is of no use here. However, Toma explains that Sophia is special. She is a buffer. All of a sudden, Sophia begins using her magic, and the entire team feels an amazing surge of power. Using this, they ready themselves and end the battle in the blink of an eye. After the fight, everyone begins showering Sophia with compliments. But all of this enrages Maria, who is angry at how all the vigilance Toma showed her has vanished into thin air. Everything that has happened makes her think that maybe Toma is already in love with Sophia, but nevertheless, she will still not back down. Toma is her prey, and she will be the one to strike him down. As such, she begins making advances towards Toma, but Sophia firmly makes her back off. This stirs up immense pressure, making Toma worried. As a result, he changes the topic and asks where the mushroom they are looking for is. And so, Sophia guides them to their destination, where they find their desired mushroom, a giant ding-dong-shaped agaric mushroom. Seeing this huge phallic-shaped mushroom, the guys begin comparing their own mushrooms to it, making Maria confused as to what these idiots are talking about. On the other hand, Sophia is concerned with the size, claiming that this one is too big and it will break if she forcefully shoves it inside, her bag that is. There, Toma asks what this mushroom is used for, and Sophia explains that it is used to make a lust suppressant drug. Apparently, there are a lot of species with highly lustful drives. However, not everyone can accept these urges so naturally. As such, this drug is distributed to the ones who are suffering between their instincts and compatibility with this species. This is the duty of those devout to the goddess of love. Hearing her inspirational speech, Toma is left mesmerized, but for now they harvest the smaller shrooms. However, Sophia's way of handling this oddly shaped mushroom is too exciting. Seeing her, both Kali and Gornoff slowly begin thinking to devote themselves to uranism, whereas Toma tells Sophia that her methods could bring chaos into this world. Understanding what he means, Sophia grows embarrassed and tries yanking out the mushroom in one go. But all this does is make the mushroom pop out of the ground and go right between her mommy milkers, making both Clay and Gornoff pass away from a nose. Nonetheless, after achieving their objective, they all head back to the church and part ways. As the team takes their leave, Maria is infuriated that she was not able to make any progress today. Not only that, Sophia is a force to be reckoned with and was even able to sway the unrelenting Toma. Although she doesn't want to, Maria has to admit that Sophia's skill set is better than hers. However, as she thinks this through, a panicked expression overtakes her face. On the other hand, inside the church, Sophia comments on how lucky the White Oath is to be friends with a guy like Toma. However, all of a sudden, her expressions change. A look of disgust paints her face as she continues, claiming that despite this, they are a bunch of low-life perverts and a thought who seduces men until their party collapses. In her mind, all this makes Toma very pitiful, but there is nothing to fear. Sophia will help Toma. For his sake, she will bring upon the party a collapse cleansing, and so she begins her ritual. One day, Maria wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, revealing that she was having a recurring nightmare. In the nightmare, it is seen that she is out adventuring with her party when the team is swarmed by a horde of monsters. Unable to fend them off, they decide to cross a bridge and then cut it off to not allow the monsters to pursue them. However, in doing so, 
they abandon Maria, who is unable to cross over to the other side, causing her to fall into the abyss below. The next morning, at the Monzen Square, Toma is seen with a bright and cheery face. Apparently, Sophia has invited them all for a picnic as thanks for helping her get her hand on the mushroom. All of a sudden, Sophia arrives in her cute, casual clothing and apologizes for being late. This is the first time Toma has seen her in casual clothes and he is taken aback by how lovely she looks. On the other hand, Maria also arrives in her casual clothes and she too looks absolutely adorable. However, as soon as she arrives, she begins with her clumsy act and tries making moves on Toma. Moments later, Gornoff and Clay also arrive in their casual clothes. There, Maria notices only Tama is still in his regular clothes and, using this as her chance, makes advances, claiming she can help him pick out some clothes if he wants. However, this doesn't amuse Sophia that much, and she, with a rather scary smile on her face, suggests they get a move on since everyone is here already. And so, as a group, they head toward the Grand Avenue. On the way, Sophia uses her timid persona, claiming that even though she wanted to thank everyone, she was not able to prepare anything special. But all the simpleton boys are just happy to be having a meal with her. Suddenly, they make their way to the picnic spot, and Gornoff sees something he cannot unsee. He finds out that his beloved idol, Ballerina, is hosting her gorilla, Liv, at that exact moment. Seeing this, Gornoff is conflicted. Should he spend time with Sophia and Maria, or should he go to his beloved idol's concert? Seeing him so torn up, Thomas suggests he go on ahead to the concert, and Gornoff takes his leave. On the other hand, Clay begins making fun of him for being an otaku, but he too spots something interesting. He sees that his coveted magic book is in stock. Once again, Clay is torn about what he should do in this situation, and again, Toma suggests he head to the bookstore. This leaves only Toma and the girls available. On the other hand, Maria feels that all of this is just a little bit too convenient, as if someone is purposefully keeping everyone away. Nevertheless, the three of them continue walking. Here they stumble upon a bathroom, and Sophia wishes to take a small break at this point. Consequently, the girls head to the bathroom and Maria is seen sitting and thinking inside one of the stalls. She still thinks that something is up, but in her mind, a nun wouldn't have been able to organize a special book event as well as a concert. But she then begins to wonder, what if Sophia is someone like her? Someone who is borrowing another's power. All of a sudden, she hears a knock on her stall door. From outside, Sophia apologizes. Hearing this, Maria notices something. This noise isn't a knock, rather it is someone pounding on the door. As it turns out, Sophia is currently in the middle of nailing Maria's stall door shut. There she claims that a crude girl like Maria is not a good match for Toma, but in response, Maria asks if a nun who planned various things to be alone with Toma is a good fit. But to Sophia, this is all for his sake only. She wishes to save Toma's pure soul and states that the goddess of love will approve of her actions. With this, Sophia begins to take her leave, leaving Maria in the stall, where she makes up her mind to escape, not wanting to let go of her prey. Consequently, Sophia walks out of the bathroom alone, and Toma asks where Maria is. In response, she exclaims that Maria was not feeling well and went home to rest for today. This just leaves the two of them, and she asks if Toma minds it at all. However, he doesn't mind. In fact, he is apologetic that only he is left even though Sophia invited everyone, but Sophia claims it's all right as long as Toma is here. And so they head to the designated spot and there, Sophia has prepared an assortment of sandwiches for them to eat and decides to feed Toma, commenting on how doing this makes her feel like they are a couple. Obviously, this is enough to make Toma flustered and he is forced to avert his eyes. As they eat, eventually, Sophia gets onto the topic at hand. Suddenly, the atmosphere becomes serious, and she proclaims that there is something she wants to talk to Toma about. Although it is a bit difficult for her to say, she claims that Clay and Gornoff, despite proving to be helpful in the recent adventure, are not good people. With a timid expression, she states that they both directed their intense gaze toward her and even Maria. Hearing this, Toma is disappointed and apologizes, telling her that he will give them both an earful. But Sophia doesn't stop there. 
She then reveals she has heard some unfavorable rumors about Maria as well, referring to how she is said to be the reason why a neighboring town's A-class party was disbanded. Apparently, Sophia is worried that a sincere guy like Tama will end up in a difficult situation if left with these strange people. Hey men who look at women with indecent eyes and women who use their feminine nature to take advantage of men are not suitable for Tama's party in her eyes, and she tells him she suggests he disband the party. Although it's not her place to meddle, she only wants to help Tama find better companions. All of a sudden, Sophia notices that someone is eavesdropping, and this person is none other than Maria, who has managed to escape the bathroom stall on her own. But not only that, it seems like she has stumbled upon an interesting conversation and decides to stay in the shadows for now and hear Toma's answer. However, much to both their surprise, Toma refuses. He explains that although both of his male companions are a bit eccentric, they are both one of the kindest and reliable people he has ever met. Not only that, even though he doesn't know all that much about Mariah, and there are some risky elements to her joining, she too is a top-notch white mage, making her a valuable part of the team. In addition, he says that he too has his share of flaws, but it's by complementing each other's flaws that they truly become comrades on their adventures. Although he appreciates Sophia's concern, he would rather keep his team intact. Hearing his response, Sophia apologizes for going too far. In her mind, she already knew Toma was a kind man and would refuse, but this is exactly why she has fallen for him. As their conversation comes to an end, Sophia suggests they head back since their lunch is already finished. Eventually, the two of them part ways and Sophia makes her way to the church. There, in a back alley, she calls out Mariah, who was following her all this time. As they both face off against each other, Maria tells her to refrain from interfering since Toma is her prey. However, Sophia isn't too happy that Maria refers to her beloved in such a manner. Asted, but Maria is not convinced. She implies that Sophia and her are of the same kind, but Sophia denies this, announcing that she doesn't intend to harm him. Nevertheless, this doesn't mean she will simply stand back and watch him get hurt. This causes a spark between the two, and they both take out their weapons of choice. Nonetheless, seeing neither of them will back down, they decide to postpone their battle for now. Sophia suggests Maria try searching for another prey, but Maria needs to bring Toma down to prove her own righteousness. This has now made these two enemies, and they both walk away from each other, vowing to bring Toma down and save him. A few days go by and one day at the tavern, Maria is left bewildered and asks why on earth Sophia is back there today. Apparently, Sophia is once again after medical ingredients, and this time, she is after what is known as the Nova Flower. It's a plant-type monster whose ivy can be used as a beneficial tonic. There happen to be a lot of elderly believers in the church, and Sophia wants to do something for them. Putting on the nice girl act, she apologizes for always causing everyone so much trouble but claims she has no one else to turn to. Hearing this, Clay and Gornoff tell her not to worry, announcing that she can ask them any time. On the other hand, Maria, who is more than aware of Sophia's true colors, obviously doubts her intentions. He is fully aware that this naughty nun is already scheming something and is up to no good. Meanwhile, Toma, recalling Sophia's concerns in the park previously, thinks that this might be a good chance for Sophia to see the good side of his companions. As a bonus, when the monsters die, they turn into magic stones as well. There, Clay adds that in order to get their hands on this monster's ivy, they simply have to cut them off before killing the monster. As the other two seem more than eager to help out Sophia, Toma turns his attention toward Maria, asking what she thinks about it. Maria, somewhat concerned, states that the mission sounds dangerous. If this medicine is the same one she is aware of, it will completely dwindle everyone's equipment. Of course, an adventurer's equipment is the life support for all their endeavors. In Maria's mind, if she flat out denies helping Sophia, she will end up looking like the bad guy since the nun is acting under the guise of helping others. But she has brought up a valid point, making her able to change the others' minds. But it won't be so easy to overwhelm Sophia. She has come prepared and reveals that it's safe, this monster will never kill anyone nevertheless. Maria is not backing down either. 
She proclaims that this monster steals the magic power by entwining with tentacle-like vines. Moreover, this is a monster they are talking about, and safety is impossible. With this, she begins acting smug, thinking she has won this battle. But that is far from the case. Only dissolving equipment and tentacles entwining around them. This sounds like the perfect way to spend the day, at least to the pervert Clay and Gornoff. Hearing these words, they both gladly accept to help Sophia out, announcing they will protect the ladies' delicate skins at all costs. Seeing their reactions and enthusiasm, Maria is left shell-shocked. Could it be that this woman had already planned the two idiots' hearts to be stimulated? On the flip side, one thing is confirmed in Sophia's mind. She is better at this seduction game than her foe. With this, she tells Maria that she can just stay back if she is worried, but there is no way that is happening. She decides to tag along, stating she too is a member of this party. All the while, she really feels the pressure of going up against this nun. Even the disadvantages he mentioned ended up benefiting Sophia. And so they all make their way to the secluded forest dungeon where Clay, Maria, and Sophia immediately get captured by the monster's tentacles, Clay explains that this monster seems to be reacting to magic, whereas everything is going as per Sophia's plan. Since she failed to disband the team through persuasion, she now plans to see and determine if these three are true champions who complement each other's flaws. However, Maria knows this nun is up to no good and vows not to let her get away with it. Nevertheless, she seems too preoccupied by Sophia to see that the monster has already begun groping them both. As they let out weird shrieks and moans while being fondled, they make for a great meme panel and watch the events unfold with sheer joy. But realizing this isn't the time for this, Talma orders Clay to use his ice magic while he and Gornoff cut off the vines they need and rescue the girls. As a result, using his powerful spells, Clay instantaneously freezes the slimy monster and Talma cuts Maria and Sophia free leaving Clay to crash directly onto the ground. As they land, Tama asks if Sophia is all right, and she, with a delighted look on her face, confirms this, adding it is all thanks to Toma. On the other hand, Maria, who looks to be annoyed by the lack of attention, angrily proclaims that she is all right as well. There, Tama apologizes for letting the monster get to the rear guard. However, Sophia tells him not to worry. Even Maria does the same, stating that she is not particularly bothered. She is just slimy and sticky, that's all. But then the effects start to take place. As mentioned previously, the slime begins dissolving the girls' equipment, aka their clothes, leaving them partially exposed as they turn beet red. Trying to shield her assets, Sophia runs up to Toma and presses her milkers onto him. Meanwhile, Toma, who is left captivated by the sight he has just witnessed, also gets flustered and offers his coat to her, which she gladly accepts. Seeing this, Maria is left impressed at her foe's tactics. She inveigles behind Toma, smoothly monopolizing his attention. Not only that, Sophia finishes off with a strong line that is sure to please a man. She sniffs the coat and remarks on how it smells like him, commenting on how it feels safe, as if she is being held in his arms. Cute! In Maria's eyes, she is playing the role of the bashful, modest nun perfectly, so much so that if someone didn't know her real personality, they would think she was naturally like this. This makes her think that maybe she is receiving her instructions from that person as well, or maybe she's just a natural charmer when it comes to men. On the other hand, Sophia is left unimpressed. To her, it doesn't look like her opponent has any experience with men. Anyway, seeing Maria get exposed, Gornoff also offers her a shirt, his dancer girl t-shirt. Despite this being in these desperate circumstances, she accepts it. However, this leaves Clay completely naked. Not only that, no one has any more garments. The only thing remaining is Gornoff's scarf, which lays shyly to unwillingly, or maybe willingly, put on around his junk as a loincloth. Eventually, Maria suggests that they head back since they have already acquired their vines, and Toma backs this up, saying they should return, especially since they are already in quite a bit of danger. However, Sophia says she still needs some more. Clay, who is already almost naked, has no qualms about it, remarking at how there is no danger to their pride. Besides, there is nothing to be ashamed of in his chiseled body. As a result, the team begins moving again. 
This time, Thomas suggests they change up the formation a bit, suggesting he stays behind in the rear guard as well going forward to protect the girls. Anne Maria tries to make advances at him, acting meekly in her t-shirt, which is barely long enough to cover her up. Seeing her in such a state, Sophia gets angry and pulls her back, telling her not to act inappropriately and stay out of Thomas' line of This sparks some aggression between the two, and noticing this, Thomas tries to change the atmosphere. He begins talking about how the tentacles create quiet troubles, their movements and slimy feel. It is tricky to deal with them, and if it wasn't for Clay and his ice magic, it would have dragged on for way longer. There, Sophia apologizes for making them all get involved in such a thing, but everyone tells her not to worry since they are happy to help. However, Maria is not keen on being attacked again if possible. Suddenly, something creeps up behind her from underground. This triggers Toma to collapse despite his skills, and he tells her to watch out. However, it is already too late now. In the blink of an eye, tentacles almost completely encapsulate her, but Toma, somehow managing to run up to her, pushes her, allowing her to escape this dire situation. But this makes Tama the one who gets trapped instead. To save him, Sophia jumps in to pull him out, but this causes both of them to get swallowed as the rest of the team can do nothing but watch. On the other hand, both Tama and Sophia crash and fall to the bottom. As they finally come to a halt, they notice just how dark it is. Consequently, Tama pulls out a flashlight-type device, only to see Sophia's big booty right in front of him. Of course, this makes him panic, and he apologizes, and Sophia, who is left embarrassed, forgives him, stating that it was just an accident. Regardless, Tama gets to investigating their surroundings, learning that they've fallen quite far down. He is left perplexed at how the monster managed to separate the team, commenting on how maybe the others ran after seeing their comrades meet their demise. However, Sophia adds that at least there are no signs of the monster following them, so they should be good for now. But this is cause for concern in itself. To Toma, this means the beast could be hunting the other three right now, and he wants to reunite with them as soon as possible. On the other hand, Sophia has no interest in doing so. She remarks that even if they are only three people, the monster will not kill them. All of a sudden, Tama begins getting the same chill he feels from Maria. Not only that, it seems to be coming from Sophia. A black begins to appear out of nowhere, and she walks forward, asking why his kindness is incredibly kind. How can he treat others with sincerity, without any ulterior motives? Hearing this, Clay claims that this is exactly what Sophia did for him as well, but she denies this, proclaiming that her kindness was driven by ulterior motives. As she gets closer and closer, she questions if Tama would treat her the same way if he knew her true nature. Suddenly, the mist completely engulfs him, and she walks out moments later, transformed into a succubus, leaving Tama speechless. He is left taken aback by her appearance, and Sophia asks if he is disappointed that a nun would turn out to actually be a succubus. However, that is not the case. Rather than being disappointed, it looks like this is too much stimulation for him. Frustrated, he averts his gaze and tells Sophia to at least cover up her front side. Seeing this reaction, she comments on how wonderful Tama really is. There, she asks if he remembers the first day they met and how he listened to her words attentively for hours on end. To him, this much is normal. However, that is not so. Sophia reveals that, in reality, most people just look at her with lecherous eyes, similar to how Gornoff and Clay view her. Then Tama asks if Sophia is also a circle crasher, and this confirms to her that Toma is already aware of Maria and her true goals. Nevertheless, he tries to convince her, stating that they should help out the rest of their party. But in response, she just comes closer to him and seductively whispers into his ear. In that moment, Toma realizes something his body won't move. At first, he suspects that magic might be influencing him, but soon enough, he comes to terms with the fact that his body is just refusing to leave this place in anticipation of what might happen if he stays. Seeing him stall, Sophia asks what's wrong. She tries to poke him, claiming that he is stiff as a rock, whereas his companions might be getting undressed at this exact moment, asking if, instead of them, 
He wants to see her get undressed instead. As she does this, she presses her ample bosom onto him. But through sheer willpower, Toma manages to get out of her clutches and create some distance. Having been broken free, Toma once again tries to convince Sophia that they return to the surface and help the others, but she refuses. With this, the pressure behind her increases, and she continues to talk, proclaiming that she hates her characteristics since they are the furthest thing from true love. Nonetheless, Toma might be different is what she wants to believe. Consequently, she unleashes one of her succubi techniques, charm, immediately making Toma's little head stand up and give a full salute. Even the pure Toma is unable to fully block out the effect of such a powerful attack, and thoughts of Sophia overwhelm his brain, causing him to collapse onto the ground. Seeing this, Sophia is left disappointed and disgusted at her powers. She explains that Sakubi are a subrace which gains vitality through sexual activities. Given their nature, they are quite proficient in doing the dirty and engage in these sorts of things quite often. But Sophia couldn't accept the aspect of her race. Because of her adamance to not casually connect for pleasure, she couldn't join in with others of her race, and ultimately, she began distancing herself. Whenever she walked throughout the city, the other races thought of her as a lustful succubus only, making her think that she is losing her place in the world. And so, out of despise for her own nature and the gaze of other races, she decided to start her life anew where no one would know her. She decides to work at a church dedicated to the goddess of love, thinking she will finally be able to get away from the lustful gazes. But it turns out that this was just wishful thinking. As it turns out, she couldn't avoid these perverted males, not even while with those who were supposed to follow the goddess of love. This sent her into despair, but that is when that person arrived. That person told her that all men are the same and suggested that rather than getting hurt and used by men, she should make better use of them. As such, she got bestowed many techniques to bring all the guys to their knees, and Sophia was able to get some hefty donations from the lustful beings. But despite this, she still had hope for the men of this world. She, using her donations, wanted to support others in a similar situation to her. Hence, she needed that agaric mushroom, and this is how she continued her time at the church. However, all that ended when Tama appeared at the church gate one day. Unlike the others, he seemed different, and hence, she began having high hopes for him. But alas, when Tama was unable to resist her charm, back in the present, she gets closer to him and touches him. But that triggers something within Toma, and he regains consciousness. Not only that, he somehow powers up tremendously and begins to glow, while his clothes tear off of his body. This leaves Sophia speechless, and she begins to wonder if Toma broke free from her charm. As such, she asks if Toma has a resistive spell, but Toma refuses, proclaiming that he got over her technique using just his sheer willpower. Although there was a way for him to remove the technique using his full status recovery, when he saw the look of disappointment on Sophia's face when he collapsed, he understood that this method would not save her. Hearing these words, she becomes more and more captivated by him, remarking at how Tama is her ideal man, but he doesn't stop there. He claims that even though Sophia thinks she had no ulterior motives while talking to him, she in fact did have them. This leaves Sophia surprised and confused, but Toma is more than ready to fully explain. He begins by telling her how provocative Sophia's nun outfit really was. In addition, her frequent smiles and pleasing act all feel like a misunderstanding waiting to happen. Her display is akin to something that would arouse males without a shadow of a doubt. Not only that, in her succubus outfit, Sophia looks even more dangerous, and Toma comments on how impractical her transformation is. In other words, what he wants to say is that although Sophia might think she is pure and refrains from enticing others, the fact is that she is a bit naughty. Hearing all this, she begins to blush and gets embarrassed, trying to make up excuses by saying that she thought Toma is always so gentlemanly towards her, but he claims that it is only natural. Everyone treats each other with respect and avoids trying to make them feel uncomfortable, adding that he doesn't want to hurt Sophia, and it doesn't matter if she is a nun or a succubus. 
Hearing all this, Sophia is left speechless. She begins thinking back to how she grew distasteful of lustful men and the characteristics of the succubus. Ever since meeting that person, she has been using her abilities to see men as nothing but wallets to empty out, but that didn't clear her consciousness. She believed that there would be someone who would be able to resist the charm of a succubus. However, it seems like she has found something else she now believes in. Listening to Toma talking about how it is a natural thing to treat others with respect as a human, she is more relieved than ever. As such, she tells Toma that it turns out she was wrong. Toma is not her ideal man. Instead, he is just a truly wonderful person. With this, she undoes her transformation and apologizes to him for pushing her concerns onto him. In response, Toma tells her to depend on him if there is something wrong since he is always willing to listen and help her out. In addition, he announces that he will now be on his way to help his teammates and asks if Sophia will assist him, and she is happy to do so. All of a sudden, an explosion occurs behind them, causing Toma to fall directly on top of Sophia. As the dust from the explosion settles down, they hear some voices coming closer to them. These voices belong to none other than the rest of their party, who have come trying to find their party members. As they hastily make their way over, worried that they might be injured, they finally manage to reunite with Toma and Sophia, only to see them both on top of each other, in a rather prone-to-be misunderstood position. Seeing this sight, both Clay and Gornoff comment on how it seems like Toma has too much energy and how it looks like he and Sophia have gotten closer. Obviously, Sophia tries to defend him as honor, but Gornoff and Clay aren't having it. They tell Sophia that there is no need for an explanation, and this is a matter between friends. And so, they begin their own punishment session where they condemn Toma as a traitor and inquire as to how their sin was. On the other hand, Sophia freaks out and begins to wonder what she should do in this situation. But Maria comforts her, telling her there is no need to worry since they have healing magic on their side. What's more, there is nothing to worry about since it is the white oath they are talking about. Seeing all this makes them share a moment of brotherhood, and Sophia is left mesmerized by what true friendship means. However, Maria is far from done. She asks what Sophia did in the time she was alone with Toma, remarking that there is no way she didn't make any advances on him. However, Sophia reveals that she was brutally shot down and suffered a complete defeat. In the back of her mind, she thinks about how she has never seen any other men like Toma and his group. After the whole ordeal comes to an end, Toma is seen in his room. However, it seems like he is pretty sick. His face is bright red, and he is coughing up a storm, making him think that he has caught a cold. In his mind, this must be because of the unusual part of the dungeon he was trapped in with Sophia. Apparently, when returning from the dungeon yesterday, Sophia also apologized to Gornoff and Clay for her inappropriate comments about their characters, though they easily forgave her and didn't seem to mind all that much. Despite this, she still must be feeling remorseful for what she did. All the while, Maria had a subtly displeased look on her face, as if everything she was working toward is slowly collapsing right in front of her eyes. Anyway, with this, everything has come to an end, or so Tama thought until he caught this cold. He even adds that his total status recovery skill doesn't work against illnesses, and hence, he will have to overcome the situation by resting. Consequently, he picks up a magical communication device, similar to the smartphones of our world, and in the group chat, tells everyone of the current predicament he is in. On the other hand, the rest of the team quickly replies to their leader and tells him to rest up. Nevertheless, Toma is still concerned about their mission today, but they all tell him to take the day off and recover. Not only that, since he is the only one sick, he calls himself careless and takes his team's advice. And so he gets some shut-eye and a few hours go by. All of a sudden, Toma is woken up by a knock on his door. Hearing this, the sick Toma wonders who it might be and stumbles out of bed to respond, only to find that Maria is standing on the other side. Apparently, she has come to take care of Toma. Even though she is clearly looking out for him, she turns up her thunder act, claiming she isn't here because of him or anything. It's just that if Toma is sick, the team's earning will also decrease, and since she is a healer and all, she can help him recover. However, Toma isn't feeling too good and begins swaying where he stands, 
Noticing this, Maria gets panicked and comes closer to him, allowing him to rest his head on her. But even in this condition, our virgin boy still has enough self-control to come back to his senses and create some distance. Seeing his unusual actions, Maria tells him to return back to the bed so she can examine his condition. Consequently, they both re-enter the room where Maria comments on how it's pretty simple and mundane. But her looking around makes Tama a bit uncomfortable, and he tells her to not stare so much. Hearing this, Maria begins acting cheeky, asking why he is so embarrassed. They have even seen each other naked, so aren't they really close at this point? Of course, Tama is not falling for such an easy trap and denies this. Nevertheless, understanding Tama is truly sick, Maria decides to check his fever. To do this, she gets closer and presses her forehead on his, learning that the leader is burning up. As a result, she tucks him into bed, makes him wear a mask, and lays a damp towel on his head to ease his discomfort. While he rests, she goes to prepare some soup for him and heads to the kitchen. There, as he lays on his bed, Tama begins to wonder if Sophia is all right, worried that she too might have caught the cold like him. But hearing these talks about Sophia, Maria gets enraged. A furious expression paints her face while she thinks about how Tama can still think about that scheming nun when he has a cutie like her taking care of him. This makes her incredibly mad, and she decides to forfeit her plan of letting Toma rest for today. Her rage is enough to trigger Toma's collapse detector skill, and fortunately, he asks her what the problem is, but she just tells him to calm down. She explains that, to help him to the best of her abilities, she will have to fully understand his health status. <laughs> As such, she begins getting closer to him, telling him not to worry since she will examine him carefully. With this, she gets on top of him and begins to undress him, stripping him of his clothes. Of course, Tama isn't too keen on this, but Maria tells him not to have indecent thoughts. This is purely for medical purposes. Nevertheless, the sick Tama is unable to resist her advance and unwillingly lets go of his shirt. This allows Maria to plop her gigantic behind onto him and sit on his body, announcing that she will first begin using the stethoscope to check his heartbeat. While she says this, she makes a rather arousing expression. Moreover, slowly but surely, she starts getting closer and closer and eventually puts the cold stethoscope on Toma's feverish body, making him let out a weird shriek. Not only that, in a rather seductive manner, Maria then begins talking about how his heart is beating very fast and starts caressing him. Realizing he is not forced into an unfavorable position, he is left to quickly think of a plan of action. On the other hand, Maria is happy that her plan seems to be working with such ease. As a result, she puts her second step into action, announcing that Toma is sweating quite profusely. As such, she suggests she dry him off to ensure his fever doesn't come back stronger, telling him to leave it all to her. But in her mind, this is all just an excuse for some physical contact. Using his quick-witted nature, he comes up with an ingenious idea. Pretend to be unconscious. Consequently, seeing Toma faint, Maria's plan is halted in place. She decides to call it for today. However, it doesn't feel right to just abandon Toma in such a state. Hence, hours later, Toma wakes up after accidentally falling asleep. As soon as he wakes up, he notices that his body is feeling lighter and his throat doesn't hurt anymore. In addition, he is feeling a lot better than he was in the morning. Slowly, he gets up from the bed and takes a look around, finding that Maria has fallen asleep while taking care of him. Not only that, in her sleep, Maria keeps calling out to Toma, making him flustered. Nevertheless, he knows Maria's true colors and announces that this trick will not work. Hearing this, Maria immediately wakes up, perplexed at the fact that even taking care of him wasn't enough to make him fall. But it looks like she really did help out Toma, and he thanks her for her efforts. But it's not like she minds. It was her day off today, and she also is indebted to him for saving her in the dungeon previously. But just thinking about this, Maria grows embarrassed and dismisses her thoughts. All of a sudden, Thomas's stomach begins to growl. Hearing this, Maria reveals she has made some soup if he wants some, and he gladly partakes. Consequently, Maria heads to the kitchen to warm it up. Meanwhile, Toma looks at her gently, commenting on how she's not such a bad girl. 
Moreover, he thinks about how great it would be if one day she could cast aside her attitude and truly accept the White Oath as her comrades. A few moments later, Maria returns to the room and shows Tama the soup she has cooked up, which looks to be a disgusting mess that seems like immediate death. Seeing this soup, Tama is left fearing for his life and asks if Maria has tasted the soup. However, she claims she has not, but despite this, the nutritional value of the meal should be perfect. With this, she begins to feed some to him, and not wanting to be inconsiderate of all the help she has provided, Toma unwillingly drinks some, immediately passing out yet again. With Toma's collapse, this marks Maria's victory for today. A few days go by and the White Oath heads over to the beach. It's finally time for the beach episode. Apparently, it was Sophia's idea since she wanted to apologize again for her inappropriate remarks. There, Clay, Gornoff, and Toma all arrive together, flexing their muscles to attract attention. Suddenly, they notice a huge commotion off to their side and learn that Sophia and Maria have already changed into their swimsuits. Is their alluring appearance and ample assets make them the center of attention, but they simply call out to the rest of their team. Seeing them wearing such skimpy clothes, all three of them are left blown away. Not only that, Maria then asks the guys what they think about her outfit, resulting in Clay and Gornoff drooling at their path while complimenting her, though she just comments on how these two are the same as always. On the other hand, Sophia begins her bashful act, asking if she doesn't look strange in her swimsuit. However, the two perverts immediately change up their tone and tell her that she looks very beautiful, just like a work of art. Nevertheless, Sophia emphasizes that she put effort into this outfit, and hence, the guys can enjoy it all they want. These words are enough to deal major damage to them and leave them in a bigger state of excitement. Seeing this, Maria comments on how it is good to see them both return to their normal selves, though she is pissed off that they had a better reaction to Sophia's bikini than hers. Nevertheless, Sophia continues her advancements towards Toma, who is concerned for her and tells her not to overexert herself. However, Sophia tells him that she is fine and in turn asks how her sexy appearance is today, making him flustered. Moreover, she comments on how she is all right since she has now found a man that she doesn't mind being seen by in such a state telling him about how she wants to make him feel excited even more going forward. This makes Tama's heart skip a beat, whereas Maria is getting more and more annoyed by Sophia's pr- to counteract this, Maria begins making moves of her own. She dashes towards Tama and hugs his arm, pressing her bosom onto him, and claims that it was a good idea to take care of him since he recovered from his cold. Moreover, she tries to inquire what happened when he and Sophia were trapped underground. But Sophia is more worried about the fact that Maria was the one who cared for Toma. In the first place, she would have headed over herself if she was informed of this. Hearing the jealousy in her voice, Maria provokes her even further, announcing that she is a part of the team after all. This statement leaves Sophia perplexed, and she too then hugs Toma's arm, telling him to inform her if such things ever happen again. This leaves Toma in between a rock and a hard place. Even though he has two beauties wrapped around his arms, he still cannot enjoy it. Regardless, they begin their day of summer activities and set up camp. While Clay and Gornoff play volleyball amongst themselves, Maria, being the scheming little tot she is, tries to make yet another move on Toma. She unties her top and asks him to apply some sunscreen on her. With this, she turns her back toward him, making him blush profusely. However, Sophia, who is standing right behind him, is not too keen on the idea and angrily takes the bottle of sunscreen from him. Not only that, out of spite, she then begins applying the lotion on Maria. All the while, Maria is still under the impression that Toma is the one doing so. This makes her a bit confused as she thought that Toma didn't have the guts to do such a thing, making her think that maybe he has let down his guard since they are out on the beach. Used to her, this is pretty convenient since she can make some progress toward her goal. As a result, she tells Toma, who she thinks is the one applying the sunscreen, to make sure he doesn't miss a spot, and Sophia hears this loud and clear. She begins rubbing the lotion on her hand, and then turns her hands towards Mariah's curvy butt. Obviously, this makes Mariah a bit uncomfortable since she doesn't have much experience with men, causing her to comment on how bold Toma's touching is. Nonetheless, as she nears her limit, 
She tells him to be a bit more secretive with his touching since Sophia is watching them as well. Hearing this, Sophia gets more and more eager to continue her rubbing, and devilish look overcomes her face, and she, after stretching her fingers, begins caressing Maria's mommy milkers, making her shriek aloud. Finally, Maria has had enough and tells the onlooker that this is going too far. However, she learns that it was, in fact, Sophia who was rubbing the lotion on her. Not only that, Sophia then begins making fun of her opponent, commenting on how Maria is even more innocent and inexperienced than she could have ever. Learning that Sophia was the one behind the fondling, Maria begins getting angry, whereas Sophia tells her that there is no way Tama would ever go so far. As they both begin to bicker back and forth, Tama eventually steps in and tells them both to get along, making them both quiet down at last. Upon his suggestion, the two also decide to call it a truce for now since they are at the beach. And so, the group finally begins their fun-filled day at the beach. They surf the waves and build sandcastles, enjoying their day off. They even start to play volleyball together. As they do so, Tama smashes the ball towards Sophia, and she tries to zone the ball back. However, she misses, causing the ball to bounce off her huge chest and go out of bounds. Seeing this, Maria asks what she is doing and heads to bring the ball back. However, as she does so, she stumbles into a dark-skinned, chiseled man. This guy begins trying to flirt with Maria, telling her she is a cutie. He even suggests that she come play with him instead of playing with those boring guys. This leaves Maria in a predicament. Seeing that no one is around to help her, she reveals that she was worried that this might happen. But in the blink of an eye, the White Oath boys come to back up their teammate and shield her from this man. Not only that, all three of them seem to be enraged that someone is trying to take away their precious Maria-chan. Seeing the monstrous expression on their faces, the man is scared to death and tries to flee the scene. But it won't be so easy. Gornoff and Clay, still furious, begin chasing him, announcing that he will pay with his life for scaring their precious Mariah. All the while Toma, who stays behind, tells Maria to call out to him if such things occur again, but she is not convinced still. She asks what they will do if the man who comes up to her is stronger than the team, but Toma just tells her that, in that case, they will all flee together. Hearing this, Maria is left mesmerized by these words at first but soon enough, realizes that they live in the real world. She comments on how it would be wiser to just leave her behind in that case, but there is no way Toma and the others will do that. Nevertheless, she asks Toma for his hand, aiming the ball at him. In addition, she then asks when those two idiots will come back, revealing that Sophia is currently being harassed by some men as well. Seeing this, Toma decides to head over to save her, but Maria refuses to let him go, claiming the others will just begin harassing her again if Toma leaves. This leaves him in quite the situation, but ultimately, he manages to drive everyone away. Soon after, Clay and Gornoff also return from their hunt, announcing that the evil has been defeated. However, Toma notices that something is off. His teammates have brought someone else with them. This someone begins a small elf girl by the name of Dinah, who asks if Toma is her older brother. <laughs> Confused by this question, Toma just awkwardly waves back to this little girl when he suddenly notices something strange. This girl is wearing a school swimsuit similar to the ones worn on Earth. As he panics about what the heck is going on, Sophia chimes in and announces that this is a school swimsuit. Apparently, it was one of the gifts brought by Hiro, and hearing this makes Toma lose a few more brain cells. Witnessing the pure and utter confusion on Toma's face, Sophia apologizes for her loud announcement, but claims that this little girl must be one of the devoted followers of the Uranus religion. However, it doesn't look like she is. The girl touches Clay and calls out to him, referring to him as Master, and asks which of the two girls is his girlfriend. But Clay clears up that these two are his companions, adding that he doesn't know what the future might hold. Hearing this, the girl asks if Master is single, claiming that she can fill that position if he wants. Seeing such a strange sight, Toma asks Gornoff just what is going on, and he explains that while they were fighting off the guy who hit on Maria, this little girl got impressed by Clay's magical potential, and now it looks like she is refusing to even leave his side. In her own words, 
The girl wants to become an amazing mage one day, and in order to do so, she needs a master by her side. And Clay eventually agrees to this, though Tama is already aware he will soon get tired of her and give up. Next up, he creates a huge sand golem using his earth magic. Ultimately, he tells her that everything is the result of unwavering dedication to training, and they both begin reading some spell books while laying in the sun. Nevertheless, Dinah spots everyone else playing in the water and having fun. Clay notices this and knowing children should have some fun alongside their training, he suggests they take a small break and join in on the fun. Consequently, he creates a water ball using his magical powers and launches it toward Toma, telling him to let them both join in as well. In response, Toma begins to shove water toward Clay as well, prompting Dina to try out Clay's attack as well. As such, he too uses her magic and creates a water ball. But it looks like she has put way too much energy into it. This causes the water ball to become gigantic and it hurls toward the rest of the party, terrifying everyone in the trajectory and creating a huge explosion. Realizing that she has messed up, Dinah immediately apologizes for her actions, but Clay states that adjusting the power of an attack is one of the most common beginner mistakes and tells her to be careful going forward. On the other hand, Sophia and Maria emerge from the attack unscathed, though Maria seems a bit pissed. There, Talma notices something. Both of the girls' tops have been blown away by the pressure of the attack, and the beam of light has rendered us unable to see the glorious sight. Obviously, embarrassed and flustered, the girls quickly hide their assets, but Maria seems to be in hot waters when her top is nowhere to be found. But Thomas spots the top soon enough. As he tells the others, Clay and Gornoff rush to retrieve it, acting like a bunch of perverts. This leads to them fighting over being the one who takes hold of it. And while Tama tries to stop their brawl, Dinah easily swims over and gets her hands on it, claiming that since she is the one who caused it to fly off, she will be the one to retrieve it. Eventually, she reaches the swimsuit, but as soon as she grabs a hold of it, a shark comes up behind her from nowhere. Seeing this, everyone is left distressed for Dinah's safety, commenting on how things could end up badly if they keep standing around. And so, the leader within Tomo wakes up, and he immediately crafts up a plan to get rid of this shark. He tells Sophia to begin her buffer magic and tells Maria to operate from her white magic. On the other hand, he orders Gornoff and Clay to prepare for the frontal assault as well. With this, he gets on Gornoff's shoulder, resulting in him getting flung toward Dina. As he soars through the air, Tama then sidekicks the shark straight in the face, sending him flying back. This allows him to save Dina but it doesn't look like the shark is giving up so easily. But there is nothing to fear. They have with them one of the most powerful wizards, Clay, who uses his advanced water magic to unleash a high-powered water cannon, causing the shark to be thrown into oblivion. Seeing this, Dina gets delighted and praises her master's strength. All the while, Maria is left speechless at how coordinated the White Oath really is, even in emergency situations. Although they usually seem foolish, they cannot be taken lightly and are amazing adventurers. Anyways, now that Dina is safe, she hands the top back to Maria and once again begins complimenting Clay on his prowess. But all of a sudden, a hooded man is seen in the distance calling out to Dina. Seeing this, Dina claims that her friend has come back to retrieve her, prompting Clay to stop the training session here for today. Hearing this, Dina is visibly bummed and asks if they will meet again. Seeing this, Clay claims that they will for sure and tells her that he, at the moment, is working as an adventurer in a holy city. This surprises Dina, who claims she too is residing in the holy city. With this, both of them promise to have yet another training session on another occasion, and Dinah bids farewell to everyone. As she returns back, Tama remarks at how energetic Dinah was, and Clay claims that she has the potential to become a good mage. On the other hand, Dinah returns to her friend's side. Upon her arrival, this hooded figure asks if this group is the White Oath, but Dinah refuses to respond to him, announcing that there are things that must be done before they speak. As such, the man immediately gets down on all fours and Dinah plops her small body onto him, using him as a chair. As she leisurely sits on him, she reveals that she was ordered by that person to come and cause destruction. Consequently, she approaches the White Oath, but to them, 
They seem like a group of genuinely kind people. Nevertheless, orders are orders, and the chairman asks how Dinah is planning to go about things, but seems to reply that she will deal with them just like always. Although two young have failed their tasks, if it is left in her hands, destruction is sure to befall the group, and he decides that the origin of the collapse will be none other than her master. A few days later, Dina is leisurely relaxing in a nearby lake all alone when two hooded figures come upon her. Seeing them arrive, Dinah's mood is spoiled, and she gets up, recalling that today is once again a training session with her so-called master. As she exits the lake, she announces that the time for chaos havoc is closely approaching. Nonetheless, she orders one of the figures to become her chair and instructs the other to fetch her a towel. With this, she then begins drying herself off when she realizes that her group of hooded minions is slowly but surely increasing. She claims that although all magicians have a lot of pride, the matter of fact is that their hearts are weak, hence the reason why she loves them so much. On the other hand, at the guild, the White Oath has just returned from their mission. There, Gornoff comments on how Maria is slowly adapting and the sense of stability in the group is increasing. Hearing this, Maria begins jumping up and down with joy whereas Tama just hopes this means that they will now be able to avoid any more incidents in the near future. Nevertheless, Gornoff suggests they head back to the tavern with their earnings and begin their after-mission meeting, but Clay claims that he already has prior arrangements for today. Hearing this, Tama asks if he has to go meet with Dinah again today, and Clay confirms this, remarking at how Dina has a lot of potential, and hence he wants to help her develop her talents. Consequently, the team tells him to go ahead, telling him to take care of himself and not overexert. Apparently, ever since the day at the beach, Clay has been meeting up with Dina at the beach and has been giving her private lessons. Therefore, they once again meet up at the beach, but today, Dina has planned something. Clay suggests that they begin from where they left off yesterday and remarks at how her magical reserve is rather low. However, Dina claims that this problem has been resolved. Unconvinced, Clay asks her to show him, and Dinah does so by letting out a huge water attack. This leaves Clay speechless, whereas everything is going as per Dinah's plan. Apparently, she planned to show Clay a glimpse of her power in the start, and now that he has begun acting like her master, he will be unwilling to recognize her greatness and realize that Dinah has far surpassed him. And this is exactly what happens. As such, Dinah then asks if she has overwhelmed Clay and if he has run out of things to teach her. However, Clay continues to teach her, stating that the road to magic is not so simple. Therefore, he decides to take the next step and shows her a legendary artifact. However, Dina is unimpressed and showcases what she can do, even without the use of this book. Using the technique mentioned, she unleashes an unbelievably strong attack rendering Clay speechless, so much so that he falls on his knees. Seeing this, Dinah begins mocking Clay, asking if this is all her teacher had and calling him a disaster of a master. 